Greetings, everyone. It is uh, certainly an honor to have this opportunity to do present um, at the second annual virtual conference on early childhood caries um, by the Center for Early Childhood Caries Research, Sri Ramachandra Institute of uh, Higher Education and Research. Uh, as we think of uh, advancements in the area of uh, early childhood caries and the management early, of early childhood caries, uh, my belief is that we now have a much better understanding of the disease process, which allows us to utilize different disease management strategies today in a much better way uh, than what we were doing before. And among those disease management strategies, there are many approaches, and one of the approaches is interim management of carous lesions in primary teeth. So my, uh, my presentation today is going to focus on interim management, which in my mind has taken a much higher place uh, than what it used to be considered as uh, just a temporary um, placeholder kind of uh, intervention. Now it can be a long-term strategy as well. So I want to delve a little bit into those strategies that we now can use uh, as a part of disease management of early childhood caries. Mm, so uh, we know that early childhood caries is uh, DMFT of one or more in any primary tooth in children less than six years. So when you see this kind of a patient uh, and you see facial um, carious lesions, you would definitely say, yes, this is ECC, that's an easy diagnosis. But what about um, patients of with, with restored lesions? So this is the same patient with restored lesion. If you were to see this patient for the first time with restorations, uh, it may not be the first thought in your mind may not be, oh, this is ECC, but that's where the, the shift has taken place. ECC is more of the disease, the disease process, and not restricted to, and the diagnosis is not restricted to untreated caries only. So even this child that who has restored facial surfaces, the same child again, would be diagnosed ECC, maybe at low risk at this point, but uh, that's the whole point of noting uh, the carious risk is a continuum. You have to kind of follow up on it, see what changes happen in their lifestyles and when the risk could go back up or be moderate or low or high. Uh, that needs to be uh, tracked very carefully to discern whether the child is high risk or low risk or moderate risk. And only untreated or treated lesions um, are not enough. We need to do more when we are talking about ECC nowadays. Uh, treated lesions would be, uh, or restorative grade would be great, and I think uh, it has its place, uh, but we need to know, have we done enough if we have done restorative care for a child? Do we need to do anything else? The question really is, is standalone restorative care effective in children? And if that is true, then once we have filled the teeth or restored the teeth, it should be all set. We don't have to worry about it. Let's look at the data that's out there. Uh, this is a systematic review that shows effect of restorative care on the levels of uh, mutant streptococci and lactobacilli, the carogenic bacteria. And this shows that um, these all patients were, were received full mouth dental rehab under general anesthesia. This shows that uh, there was significant reduction in the levels of mutant streptococci and lactobacilli in all these studies. Um, so that's that's great news. The only thing that this study does not, this force plot does not show, but it's in their paper, is that the effect lasted uh, a short duration from six months or onwards. The microflora uh, went back to where it was in terms of uh, uh, this biosis and uh, invasion of um, carogenic microflora. So the effect of restorative care on suppression of carogenic microflora seems to be short-lived. Um, talking about relapse in terms of new caries or secondary caries, uh, it ranged from six months to two years as little, well, not really little, but 37% to 79% of cases um, had a relapse or new lesions after receiving full mouth dental rehab, restorative care under general anesthesia in these studies. So there is reduction in microflora, but it comes back. There is uh, 
Um, obviously, you're taking care of all the teeth when you're doing full mouth dental rehab, but you start seeing new caries, if nothing else, uh, if, if there are no other additional interventions are done, which which brought us to the paradigm shift towards caries disease management. And the paper by Dr. Ang was the one I'll go to in a bit, uh, which said that you have to think about disease management strategies and um, which really includes some in-office and at-home components, nothing out of ordinary, nothing that we don't do or, or already, but putting the pieces together, putting the puzzle together and, and taking it to your patients so that they can utilize some of those interventions to have better outcomes um, in disease management uh, for, for ECC. Um, their study, Dr. Yang's study, they looked at three outcomes in two different centers. Um, uh, the outcomes they looked at were new cavitation pain and referral to operating room. They used disease management strategies for based on the risk assessment of the patient, low, moderate, and high. And that included restorative care, but other strategies at home and in office, it, it, it included different um, quicker recalls for high-risk patient um, six months recall for low risk patients, those sort of things. And what they noted is uh, by simple disease management strategies, they were able to reduce, they were able to reduce new cavitations, pain and referral to the operating room in both these centers in Boston Children's and St. Joseph Hospitals. Um, so which, which shows that disease management strategies were really effective in controlling ECC. So when we're talking about treating dental caries, we should think about treating the disease process, which would require some disease management strategies and the care pathways. And there are multiple care pathways out there. And the second, um, we need to think about how do you want to manage that carious lesion? Now, managing carious lesions was restricted to, our thought process was restricted to definitive care or restorative care. Uh, now we are seeing there is evidence that you can choose some interim uh, therapies that will uh, help you achieve caries control, help you manage the disease, control the disease. And uh, while you are planning definitive care, or maybe you're planning to just monitor those. So the topic today is going to be more on management of caries lesions, but just to touch on the care pathways. Uh, there are, as I said, there are multiple care pathways out there. I will show you the AAPD's care pathway, one example of it. But I know there are uh, multiple publications with uh, excellent care pathway suggestions out of Europe and other places. So this is the AAPD one. This is for zero to five year old. And again, this is based on low, moderate and high risk. And um, based on the diagnosis, the recall, and the, num the, the radiograph frequency varies, um, then you can have interventions like fluoride, dietary counseling, sealants, and of course, restorative care as well as needed. And you could choose to do surveillance, active surveillance as needed based on the risk of that particular child. Moving on to management of care lesions. So management of caries lesions can be done in various ways. Uh, some strategies are based uh, or focus on remineralization. These are non-invasive strategies. It could be professional or home care, like fluorides, active surveillance, um, diet, biofilm controlled measures. Then there are strategies that focus on remineralization repair. They're minimally invasive. Um, the mixed strategies that such as sealants, resin filtrations. Uh, interim therapeutic restoration, or ITR, also known as sedative fillings, then mix strategies like art, hull technique. And then there are strategies based on repair that are more invasive and surgical in nature, um, like tradition, traditional restorative strategies uh, or extractions. Um, the the non-invasive or minimally invasive strategies that we're going to focus on today are active surveillance, interim therapeutic restorations, and silver diamond fluoride. The goals of these uh, um, strategies is to do caries control. Um, some are sometimes uh, they're helpful for pulp diagnosis, especially ITRs, when you're not certain about um, uh, the status and uh, pulpal status of the tooth, and you want to uh, understand it better before you place a definitive restoration. You could choose to do an ITR, and which will help you. 
and of course, uh, buying time as you are um, deferring uh, definitive care or restorative care for multiple reasons out there, uh, you may choose to do that it would, based on your clinical judgment. Um, moving on to active surveillance. So there, there's surveillance and there's active surveillance. Surveillance is when you're monitoring uh, a child who may have a change potential for change in the risk um, to maybe low risk, but there is some indicators that uh, risk factors could change. You may want to monitor this child, put the child under surveillance. It's a very passive process, whereas active surveillance is of more of an active process where you have identified some high risk or moderate risk or identified initial lesion. Now you don't you feel that you can somehow control uh, the factors and or introduce interventions that can remineralize that lesion or arrest the lesion. So it's there focused on uh, active surveillance is focused on that and essentially in uh, managing the caries lesion, initial caries lesions um, by interventions at home and in office. Again, based on the risk, you would you could choose various levels of intervention. The key is really to have a quicker recall and monitoring the progression of the of the in, initial lesion that you've seen. And so you may recall as quickly as one month or three months. And if the lesion is progressing, despite all the interventions that you that you have planned, discussed with the with the parent and introduced. Uh, if this lesion is progressing, you may choose to do definitive care. Or if it's not progressing, you may choose to just keep actively monitoring those lesions on a long-term basis as well, which is which is usually referred to as active surveillance. Here are some examples of successful active surveillance. This is one and a half year later. This um, active lesion here, after one and a half years, you can see it is actually well controlled and uh, arrested. Uh, a lesion that you can see in the radiograph right here, after one year, you can see that it is actually a little remineralized, not progressed for sure. Um, a lesion here between the two primary molars, you can see this lesion is not progressed. And there may be some remineralization if you look at the DEJ area compared to pre, and this is post, there may be some remineralization after a year. By active surveillance. Similarly, other lesions you can see here, maybe some remineralization, maybe not progressed, maybe the quality of x-ray, but it doesn't seem to have progressed for sure. So these are examples where there were some initial lesions that haven't progressed certainly uh, over a year time or a year, one and a half year time just by active surveillance, which means actively monitoring by changing some lifestyle at home that tackles the risk factors and increasing some sort of proactive interact, uh, interventions in office when you bring them on a regular or more frequent recall. Then we have the interim therapeutic restoration. Interim therapeutic restoration um, is very similar to the atraumatic restorative technique. I think the intention is uh, different. That's the main difference. But there is strong evidence essentially from an analysis that um, a glass cyanum or high viscosity glass cyanum or filling on a single surface especially uh, works great. And it can be used for caries control on multiple open lesions prior to definitive restoration. That's what APD best practices say on restorative right now. Again, going to ART and ITR, as I mentioned, and I'm sure you know this, um, ART is, um, is essentially the same thing where the difference being that it's in a, uh, the intent is different, ART is in an outfield setting where there's lack of access to care or lack of facilities. It's a community measure to control caries where you would clean up whatever little caries you can with a, with a hand instrument or a spoon excavator and put glass sanomer in it, and that's it. That's the final restoration, sort of. In ITR, it is essentially the intent is different. This is a procedure that you're doing in your office. You're, again, minimally removing uh, any caries. If at all, you're removing caries, putting glass sanomer, and you can be doing it to achieve caries control. You could be doing it to uh, defer treatment for pulp diagnosis and um, where you feel that ideal or um, definitive treatment is uh, is not possible. And I, 
and I say um, I deal um, very carefully here because now I feel as we have advanced in our understanding, even inter, uh, interim treatments are are ideal and can be long term strategies. So I I rather say more uh, ITR can be um, done as an ideal treatment where definitive treatment is not possible. If you're concerned about leaving caries behind, please please don't be. There's ample ample evidence uh, suggesting um, and that there's no concern. There are obviously conventional um, complete excavation techniques and there's selective caries removal techniques that, that have been advocated, which could be selective removal to form dentin for shallow or moderately deep lesions or selective removal to soft dentin for uh, advanced or deep lesions, cavitated lesions. Then there is stepwise excavation where you would remove uh, partial caries and then go back, um, re-enter the lesion after a few weeks and clean up the rest of the affected dentin and then restore. And finally, there is no caries excavation, which has actually become uh, popular and has good evidence supporting it, especially for hall technique, where you would not remove any caries and um, place a crown on it. And what minimalistically... Um, um, in, uh, invasive dentistry is is showing us is that if you provide a conducive environment for the tooth to heal or remineralize, it'll just do that. And so, um, so it it is. There's a lot of good evidence that shows you can do selective caries removal or no caries removal sometimes. But here's uh, one systematic review that I'll I'll go over. It's it's a well done systematic review by Swendeke in 2013. Um, there are many, um, there are a few more out there, a few recent ones as, as well, but I think the results um, haven't changed much. Uh, this one uh, compares in complete caries removal um, versus complete caries removal, and it's a good one to drive the point home. Um, they looked at pulp exposures, they looked at post-op symptoms, they looked at restoration failure when you did incomplete caries removal versus complete caries removal. So when it came to uh, pulp exposures, their finding was that um, incomplete caries removal had 69% less chances of pulp exposure compared to complete caries removal, which is fantastic. So incomplete works better there. Uh, when they looked at post-op pulp symptoms, they found that incomplete caries removal favored lesser uh, post-op pulpal symptoms compared to complete removal complete caries removal. So it's touching the line of no effect, but it's favoring uh, incomplete removal. So that's, again, in favor of uh, incomplete removal. And when it came to restoration failure, I know a lot of clinicians are concerned that if we leave caries behind, will the restoration stick? Will it fail more? And this force plot shows that there's no difference in restoration failure based on the caries removal technique. So um, to summarize that, if you did incomplete caries removal, you had lesser chances of pelvic exposure. You probably had lesser post-op symptoms and your restoration is likely to be unsuccessful if you did complete caries removal. So there's good evidence again to, sh to, to, to make my point uh, that you can do selective caries removal to hard or, or uh, so firm or soft dentin depending on the depth of the cavity. And you may also do no caries removal uh, if you're planning to choose a technique like a hall technique where you can ensure a good seal. Here are some examples of caries control um, where this patient had active, multiple active deep lesions and we wanted to, um, before we start quadrant dentistry, we wanted to do a little bit of caries control and also get pulp diagnosis. So just class cyanomers to do that. That is a great example of that. And an example here where um, ITR was placed first in a deep caries lesion. And in the subsequent visits, when we are positive of the pulp, um, we removed the glass cyanomer, um, removed some more caries. There's still some affected dent in there and put uh, indirect pulp therapy with Vitrobond followed by a crown, and that's how that was completed. Um, and here's an example where caries control and pulp diagnosis was um, was the purpose of putting an ITR filling. So you have these uh, x-rays showing uh, deep proximal lesions in upper primary molars. Um, and 
the, the initial lesions, four months after the glass sonomers that are placed in there, 10 months after glass sonomers, and there's no need. What we're seeing is that these, these restorations are sticking well. They're, they're, they're doing their job. There's no need to go back and do anything else. Just follow up these patients. They look clinically, they look good. They look radiographically good. They're doing their job. And uh, just to share, I'm on restorative guideline panel for ADA. And I can tell you that there's good evidence supporting use of glass animals as, as restorative, uh, especially resin modified glass animals for class two restorations as well, which is coming up. So um, in such a case where you've used an ITR with a glass animal for the purposes, you've done a good ITR, you, you may just choose to observe it on a long-term basis. There's no need to go back in and do definitive care. Uh, finally, I want to move to silver diamine fluoride, and we all know what silver diamine fluoride is now. It's been it's been used for and uh, for many years um, by I think a lot of countries now use it. It's Thirty eight percent silver diamine fluoride is the product we have, which is really mostly silver and, and fluoride. Um, and you know it, it, the mechanism of action. Um, I'm not going to get into that, but. I wanted to get a little bit into the indications, um, but essentially silver and fluoride ions penetrate um, into enamel um, and into dentin. Um, of course, fluoride is anti, uh, antimicrobial. It also is anti it promotes remineralization. Silver has antimicrobial action and silver protein conjugates uh, um, th that form increased resistance to acid dissolution and, um, and enzymatic digestion. Um, so the density of mineral really increases and it hardens when you apply silver diamond fluoride. Indications can be plenty, and this is just a laundry list of things you could use it for, high-risk kids that are pre-cooperative as a disease management tool, for patients with um, medical complex needs, serostomia, special needs, uh, patients with behavioral issues where you want to arrest caries, patients that are listed for your OR who are waiting for sedation OR, Patients um, in which you choose to do active surveillance for incipient lesions, you may choose STF as an intervention that to aid in your active surveillance. Uh, for smooth surface approximate lesions that are initial lesions, perhaps again, um, we'll discuss a little bit more about um, using it as, in, uh, as a silver modified ART technique or under, um, under a glass animal or restoration. Uh, but also another indication is um, uh, where you have limited access to care or there's a financial concern and you're trying to control the disease, getting preventing it from getting worse. That would be a great uh, indication for SDF again. We know AAPD um, guidelines, clinical practice guidelines um, now have been out for a few years now. They recommend use of um, SDF and the guidelines um, basically state uh, that there is a um, at least 48% higher success rate in case these in arrest control compared to the controls. This is a semi-annual application. Um, and uh, the recommendation is conditional, though in favor of using um, SDF for arrestment of caries lesions. Now, since AAPD did this publication, there was more data and more research published. And when ADA did its uh, guidelines in 2018, they were actually able to use more data and come up with a strong recommendation on moderate quality of evidence to support use of uh, silver diamine fluoride in primary dentition, and even uh, uh, some conditional recommendation for use in permanent dentition. I just wanted to touch over a few studies on silver diamine fluorides that might help uh, you decide and select the cases you um, use SDF for. This one is by Fung et al. in 2018 use SDF for three to four year olds, the 30 month data, they use 12% and 38% SDF annual and semi-annual. One thing is clear, 38% works better. Another thing is clear that semi-annual application works better than annual application. So you're gonna use 38%, you do wanna do it semi-annual if you wanna make it work. Um, the other thing that was interesting in their paper was they looked at different teeth and they found, let's look at semi-annual here. They found that it really worked better for anterior teeth, upper and lower, lower the best, followed by upper anterior, and then for posterior teeth. 
uh, upper and lower. So really what it's showing is if you choose to do, um, if you did 10 STF applications on lower anterior teeth, nine out of 10 would be successful in arresting caries. If you did 10 uh, STF applications on posterior, uh, prim posterior primary teeth, five or six out of the 10 would be successful. Um, another, um, uh, the, the, obviously the operator uh, is important how, how expert you are in doing it in the application, any challenges you're facing and applying it, that's important. Oral hygiene and cleansability is also important. Actually, authors reported that children with higher visible plaque index had lower chance of um, caries being arrested, which means that you just can't have one aspect of it. The STF alone is not enough. You need to have to ensure that there's good oral hygiene as well. Another paper, very really recent, 2022, uh, on one to three-year-olds, they did semi-annual application, um, and they used um, uh, this for non-cavitated enamel lesions and cavitated enamel lesions. I see that's two and three. For for easy reference, here's a scale for ICDAS, uh, full ICDAS. So they used the ICDAS two and ICDAS three, and they found that its effectiveness on um, enamel caries was very close to its effect to to um, fluoride varnish effectiveness. So I said as two and three, uh, STF was as good as fluoride varnish almost, very com comparable. Um, of course, um, if there's poor oral hygiene, visible plaque, then there's lower chances of it getting um, for the caries to rest. So if it's enamel lesions, non-cavitated initial enamel lesions, you can probably, I would think, in my mind, I think if I have convinced the parent for STF, I would say I'll do STF in three months. If I'm doing active surveillance, I'll do STF on the baseline. Three months, I'll do fluoride varnish. At six months, I'll do STF. So I'll rotate them like that uh, when I'm doing active surveillance for an initial lesion. Another article in published in 2018 uh, looked at ICDAS 3, 4, and 5, 6, uh, and if we look, they did not do semi-annual applications. They compared STF annual, and that's why their arrestment rates are a little low with fluoride varnish. And what they found was, again, for initial lesions, um, uh, was, I see that's three or four, a moderate decay, it was comparable to, uh, to uh, sodium fluoride uh, uh, varnish, but for deeper lesion, dentin lesions, STF seemed to do better. Again, in terms of uh, plaque, uh, visible plaque, you, it, it lowered the chances of arrestment. So semi-annual is better than annual. Annual is better than three weekly applications for shallow, uh, uh, for non-cavitated or initial enamel lesions or moderate caries. STF and uh, fluoride one issue may rotate it for an adequate effect. For deeper lesions, you may want to go with STF alone. This one is um, published in 2020, and this uh, was done on one three year olds. Um, they uh, compared STF with fluoride varnish again, uh, fluoride varnish again. Uh, but in this, uh, they did um, 10 second application, and that's why they had lower risk rates. So it's important that your application time is close to a minute. Um, and another th important thing about this paper is they again looked at the, the location of the tooth and they found that it worked better for anteriors and compared to posteriors. And they also looked at surfaces and they found that it worked better for buccal or lingual smooth surface, followed by proximal smooth surface, and it worked minimally on the look loser surface. They had lower uh, arrest rates because they, were, they saw younger kids, their application time was really low, um, and the baseline DMFD was high of these group. Uh, again, there was correlation between um, um, the number of times of, of the child was feeding, snacking, and hygiene. So those are important. So uh, SDF in, in silo is not going to do anything. You want to make sure other caries risk factors are, are reduced as well. So is SDF a silver bullet? Um, not really, but it's a great tool to have in your disease management kit. If you can reduce other risk factors, rotate it with fluoride varnish or use it alone, you can definitely cause arrestment of caries. Just choose carefully where you are using it. If you're using it in anterior teeth, your chances of success are better compared to posterior teeth. Your chances of success are better on, uh, on smooth surfaces compared to occlusal surfaces. 
Uh, here's a case which uh, was a medically complex need with um, all these uh, lesions. STF was placed, and um, afterwards there was uh, this um, treat, patient was treated in the OR and strip crowns were placed. So the end results was great. Um, just to touch on SMART, um, which is silver modified ART. Question is how SMART is SMART. What we know is that STF, as I said, semi-annual application, semi application alone is very effective. We know that ITR alone is very effective. What we don't know is, is there any additive effect uh, or benefit or a synergistic effect um, of, of those two together? That means an STF under ITR, is it causing or art, is it causing any additional advantage? We don't know. If you already have 90 plus percent success with ITR, then how much value would SDF add under it? We don't know that. Um, what we know is that one-time application of SDF is just arrestment rates are as low as 34%. Plus on occlusal surface, it doesn't work so well. And there are other factors that have to be controlled for SDF to work. So a synergistic effect under a glass enamor is not really clear. Um, is there an indirect benefit to adjacency? That's not known. Uh, but if you choose to do it for a certain case and, and you want to do it, uh, I would say do it in two visits. So you can place STF in first visit, bring back in second visit uh, to put your rest to your glass armor so the rest uh, discoloration is minimum. Um, it will restore form and function. Um, advantage, uh, well, in some of the cases like MIH and posterior teeth and permanent teeth, I, I think they probably will reduce sensitivity. I don't have a lot of uh, cases that I've done like that, but uh, in theory, it can help. So there's no harm, um, but if you do it in the same visit, uh, the only harm potentially is uh, discoloration, like you see in this photograph. Uh, advantage, I don't know what the advantage is because um, we don't have enough science, but I know there's research being done on it. So hopefully we'll have more data and more science to support that. With that, I would like to conclude saying that uh, when you are looking at management of dental caries, treat the child for caries, not the tooth for cavities, think beyond drill and fill dentistry. Restorative dentistry is definitely a part of an effective part of disease management, but please do consider interim management uh, as a as a strategy and sometimes a long term strategy, and use evidence to guide your clinical decisions. Um, thank you so much again. I want to thank uh, the organizers of uh, this conference for having me um, giving me an opportunity to present at this forum. Thank you. I'll see you at the Q and A session. All right. Bye bye.